Hello, uh, I'm Doug Calder, and I'm with my guest, uh, Michael C. Keith. How are you doing, Mike? Good, Doug. Uh, good uh, to be here with you again. Again. Yeah. Um, Mike, uh, I, uh, Michael is the author of 30 books, volumes, and dozens of articles on the subject of radio and broadcast studies. In addition um, to his nonfiction titles, Keith has published over a dozen creative works, including an acclaimed memoir. The Next Better Place, which I taught at Endicott College for, many, yeah. for a long time. Uh, a young adult novel, Life is Falling Sideways, and several short story collections, most, le most recently Slow Train and pers Perspective Drifts Like a Log on a River. Manhattan Press will publish his next story collection, Let Us Now Speak of Extinction. His fiction has been nominated for several awards, among them the Penn O. Henry Award, the Pushcart Prize, the National Indy Election. Um, uh, Excellence Award and the International Book Award. He is a uh, professor emeritus at Boston College. Um, Mike, um, we were just talking about um, in your new Extinction book, um, uh, what's the name of the title again? Is, uh, uh, Let Us Now Speak of Extinction. Right. A cheery title. And you use a uh, quote from Somerset Maughan. Dying is very dull and dreary affair, and my advice to you is have nothing whatever to do with it. Um, and that's sort of sat you know satirical <laughs> and right, glib right. and uh, arch. Yeah. You, you have the same sort of attitude, it seems to me, in your books of short fiction. Yeah, I, I, you know, I do. Uh, it, it's pretty hard not to have anything to do with it. But I figure since it's inevitable that we do have to have something to do with it, we might as well have a good time uh, confronting something like this and my approach is to look at it through the lens of irony and and humor rather than uh, fear and desperation maybe that's my way of protecting myself and so yeah so there's always that um, sense of humor in your work you don't take yourself in fact you almost in, in these little <coughs> pieces you, you almost you almost um, make fun of people who do take themselves seriously. In yeah, a sense. Yeah. And, and I think uh, I'm also making fun of myself yeah. because I don't want to say here that, uh, that I don't take it seriously. I mean, uh, to sit no, down. No, taking oneself seriously. Uh, taking oneself, s s yeah, exactly that. I mean, uh, I, I just, uh, uh, I, I'm not composed of the molecules that would allow me to take myself seriously because I know I'm too deranged in too many ways. But I try to use that derangement to my advantage. Uh, a, a, and in the process, I hope that I'm conveying something that may give people uh, 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 a sense that all is not necessarily lost because we come to a terminus that uh, 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 who knows? Who knows what, what might be on that door? And so I speculate on that a, a, a little bit. Uh, Are you a religious man? Do you have any conception? I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a religious man, but I'm not uh, what you'd call a diehard atheist. I, I, I tend to take the coward's approach, excuse me if you're agnostic out there, but uh, I hedge my bets. Uh, I, I, I think of myself as an agnostic in the sense that no one can prove that, uh, that there isn't an otherness beyond the grave, and, uh, it, and no one can prove really, as far as I'm concerned, that there is. Maybe really religious people can say, everything you see is evidence that uh, uh, an oversoul of superior intelligence is, is at work here. So, um, you know, and I tend to alternate from those, from those perspectives, albeit I think I lean much more toward uh, the doubt uh, of the existence okay. of something beyond. Now, you, you work in a form that in French is known as Pensees? Yeah, pensees. Well, uh, tell, me what, tell me about that. Well, uh, they're little evocative statements. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. I'm not quite sure where I, uh, I saw that, tea, uh, that term. It may have been Lydia Davis, uh, but I, I thought, well, you know, uh, I like the term better than micros mm -hmm. uh, because uh, micros uh, simply have more to do with the description of the structure uh, in the length, whereas pensées have to do with 
with uh, uh, evocation, with, right. with evocative, with message, uh, with statement. Um, so um, I was going to ask you, uh, um, we, you, were t you, you, was, you were talking, we were going to talk about some of the people influenced you, and I remember you also were a great deal of uh, influenced by Ray Bradbury, and yeah. you met Ray Bradbury. I think I we did. discussed that. But um, his style was, uh, uh, what did you admire about him? Well, what did you take from him? I, well, obviously the thing that I loved about him, and I think it was early on, was, was his, the expansiveness of his imagination, that he could travel to all sorts of areas, but at the same time still be rooted in social reality, mm -hmm. such as Fahrenheit 451. Uh, and I also was a fan of his succinct style. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't flowery, but at the same time, it had lyric to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what other? You said you uh, other people, uh, your short story writers. Yeah. Right? yeah and I, and <laughs> I think I mentioned yeah. to you, too, the last time I was on your show, you said, uh, uh, what are some of your uh, favorite writers and influences? And it was uh, it, it just felt like a huge tsunami wave because all of a sudden, having constantly read short stories, I just couldn't remember. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd imagine Raymond Carver might have had that. Raymond Carver's wonderful in, you know, from, from his era, of course, there's... Because, uh, uh, you know, you're a, sort of a minimalist in style. And, uh, yeah, yeah I, think, I think you could say that. I like John Cheever, yeah. you know, from, from back then. But uh, top of my list in the last couple of years has been Lydia Davis. I love Lydia Tell Davis. Tell me about her. Yeah. Well, Lydia Davis I is really the grand dame of pensées or the micro. Uh, funny, evocative, profound, uh, and, and prolific on top of that. Uh, and another person who, who kind of falls into that category is Joy Williams, uh, who I like very much. Laurie Moore is wonderful. William Trevor is, is great. He's um, a great Irish, he's deceased now, but he was a great Irish. Oh, yeah, Irish. absolutely. Was, you have these lives of quiet desperation, so <laughs> if you remember that. Yeah. yeah, which I like a whole lot, lot, lives of quiet desperation. I think that's my theme in a lot of ways, too. But... Uh, uh, I also like uh, a writer who I've become uh, f uh, an acquaintance with. Uh, Alan Weir is just an absolutely wonderful storyteller. Uh, Richard Bosch is just, uh, you know, ju just, just fantastic. Dennis Johnson, of course, who just has, who posthumously published a book that has just come out and gotten rave, rave reviews. I like some young writers like Karen Russell whose novel was Vampire in a Le uh, Lemon Grove, but also wrote a book of, of wonderful, wonderful, wonderful short stories. And then there are uh, those who, who are still around but are getting long in the tooth in their 80s, like Edith Perlman. Uh, she's fantastic. It's amazing how many really uh, incredibly good short story writers there, there are out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, flash fiction, how does yours differ from flash fiction? It's probably shorter than flash fiction. Right? Well, uh, um, the question is, uh, uh, is flash fiction micro fiction? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I'm not sure I can make the distinction between flash fiction. It seems to me flash fiction, just by the name flash, would be something that would be extemporaneous and with a powerful punch but very concise very succinct, uh, whereas microfiction, I think, is anything that might be under 300 words, uh, and pensées could be one sentence. In fact, in Lydia Davis's uh, uh, collected works, which is about 600 pages, she has w s many wonderful stories that are one sentence. Now, um, you, uh, uh, your wife, we were talking about your wife who's an Suzanne. artist and, and, and um, her uh, son. Yeah. Her son, what's his name? Her son uh, is Eric Corrigan and Eric uh, uh -huh. did this cover to my new book. Uh, he's a wonderful abstract writer. Uh, he did... Uh, an, I thought uh, you said he was an abstract painter. Uh, I'm sorry. Painting. Thank you. Yeah, He's yeah. a wonderful abstract painter. And he did another cover and he may well be uh, providing uh, uh, the, the cover art for the Mad Hat Press, Let Us Now Speak of Extinction. He's now, how did you wonderful. hook up with the Mad Hat Press? Uh, 
You know, that's a really good question. I think I, I, I had heard his name through Gloria Mindock of Trevena Barva, uh, uh, and uh, I was on Facebook, and I think I friended him. One thing led to another, and then I heard that he was reading from his newest work he, in, in this area, and attended that, and told him I had a manuscript, and and he said, of course, he had stacks of them up, but he was very generous by saying, send it and I'll look at it. And fortunately, he liked it and he said, okay, uh, we'll publish it. Now, um, uh, you're, you're, um, The Next Better Place, uh, which is a sort of a memoir piece, uh, uh, about you as a young boy right. and going around with a sort of ne'er-do-well father and living in rooming houses going across the country. Um, now, I read that this is being, you gave it to a Hollywood agent and <coughs> yeah, recently, and um, what's going on with that? Well, it's with this agent right now, uh, uh, an interesting sidebar on this is this agent turned, uh, was actually a student of mine almost 40 years wow. ago. And through other students, he heard that I had written uh, a memoir, and then he befriended me on Facebook, and, and we had a lot of wonderful catching up to do. And then he said, oh, I'd like to, to look at this. He read it, he loved it, and uh, now he's in the process of attempting to put a package together. He's been in Hollywood for 35 years, involved in many, many uh, projects as wow. producer and, and so this whatnot. is good, as good a shot as any yeah yeah I think he's because uh, of how long he's known me uh, I think he uh, feels a level of commitment to it that may be someone who who's a stranger and uh, he's a smart guy and a very determined guy and so who knows we'll see what happens yeah. I mean I think it is, does have very many cinematic possibilities yeah I think it's very visual yeah. now um, we, I was going to ask you, uh, if you talk about, I quoted you somewhere um, that everything in a short story, that, well, that the most important element in the short story or work of fiction is conflict. Conflict, conflict, conflict. Yeah, it's pretty hard to do something without conflict. Yeah. I mean, uh, if, uh, uh, you know, I, I think of uh, the Nouveau Roman, uh -huh. uh, which is something that I think prides itself, and I may have this wrong to all of the English professors out there, that, that doesn't embrace plot or, or conflict. Um, uh, well, I mean, you, you can have a conflict within yourself, right? That could be conflict. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't have it to be external necessarily. Yeah. I mean, God, there's plenty internal uh -huh. monologue conflict, you know. But I don't know if, 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 if that's what it, you know what it's doing. It's been a hundred years since I was in graduate school, so I, I'm a little vague on, on uh, these uh, literary uh, genres and traditions. Okay, um, and um, I was just going to ask you briefly uh, about the. Um, you know, you taught radio for many years. Yeah, uh, and you wrote the major textbooks on radio that were used in sure. many colleges and things like that. Um, I mean, if you, if you were, uh, would you have a job in, in starting out now in, with teaching radio? I mean, the radio, what I mean is that radio is becoming less and less. Yeah, um, uh, the um, uh, image and, and prevalence of radio has diminished significantly in the digital age, uh, you know, mostly to do with, with the internet. Uh, stations are downsizing around the country and, and the numbers of stations is getting smaller. There's a lot of them that are going silent. Uh, and, and I see that in colleges and universities, they're aware of this, whereas 20, 25 years ago, they would offer in communication uh, programs courses devoted to radio operations, radio management, radio programming. Those are becoming, becoming fewer and far between. Uh, ten years ago, I, I saw that happening and I decided that I would shift gears and uh, uh, examine radio as a social commodity, uh, as a historical commodity. 
uh, and I do teach a course and have taught a course at Boston College, which I generated, which I created called Radio and Culture in Society, that looks at the impact of radio from its inception on culture and, and society, because it was profound, it was significant. Radio uh, altered uh, the lifestyle of Americans. Uh, it uh, revolutionized uh, uh, the way people interact, the way people perceive uh, the world in general. So, Mike, I want to give you some time to read from your, uh, your newest books. Uh, well, are um, uh, Slow Transit and Perspective Drifts, and your one coming from Mad Hat Press. Uh, Let, <laughs> yeah, let us now you know, speak of extinction. Of uh, but uh, uh, so uh, let me just. Uh, you have read about it. twelve minutes. Oh, good. I'll yeah. read a, uh, some short pieces, and and um, uh, and then you can uh, get the hook. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is called uh, uh, note accompanying supper. I come home after nine hours on the assembly line. It's late. It's dark. My blood. Uh, my bloody arthritis is really killing me. When I enter the flat, I smell supper. I'm starving, and I shout to my wife that I'm home and ask, what's for supper? She doesn't answer, so I go to the kitchen. There's a plate on the table and a note next to it. It reads, gone out with the girls, eat your fish sticks. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, let's see, I've marked that's these. A, you know, that's an image. Eat a, a lone man eating fish, fish yeah. sticks in the evening. The fish sticks are the perfect um, <laughs> metaphor uh, food for, for uh, desolation. Yeah. yeah, it is. Yeah, it's kind of a lonely food, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> fish sticks. This is called Forthcoming Past. The SS Erickson anchors at Pier 84 in Manhattan on the Hudson. It carries thousands of smiling and cheering troops just returned from the battlefields of Europe. It's 1946, and from where I sit, gazing at this grainy photo 70 years later, it occurs to me that all of these young men, so eager to get on with their lives, have by now spent them. And let me find another here. It's harder to find World War II veterans. Yeah. What's that? It's harder to find World War II veterans. It is. My father was one. Oh, yep, yeah. as was mine, as was mine. This is called uh, the quality, uh, the importance of quality sound. Sotheby's was engaged in a debate about an item called Hiroshima glass. Mm -hmm. According to its owner, the artifact came from ground zero of the bombing of the Japanese city. What he claimed made it unique, beyond it having survived the atomic blast, was that it contained the residue of victims of the detonation. When he told Sotheby's that one could actually hear the casualties agonized screaming if one put one's ear close to it, the auction house decided to end its representation of the object on the basis that the intonations were analog rather than digital, which it believed significantly reduced its monetary value. And let's see, do I, I have time for another oh, one? Oh, you've got, oh, oh, I've got heaps and heaps. Minutes, yeah. Oh, good. Let's see if I can maybe <laughs> These slips of paper uh, tend to fall out of here, and, and then I'm left looking confused. I guess I should use larger pieces of paper the next time, huh? Okay, let's see. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, this, this, this one is, is kind of a tribute, well, it's not kind of a tribute, it's a tribute to m my, m my would-be mentor, Lydia Davis. It's called the inspiration and curse of the superior talent. Is everybody else under the spell of Lydia Davis? Do you stop reading and dash to your keyboard because she's once again activated something in you? Have you written a piece that's still inferior?
to everything she's ever written. That's the way you feel about these things sometimes. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can. Uh, let's see this. Now I've lost my markers here, but there's so many of these sh short little ones. Uh, this one, oh, this one is called Wound Dresser, and uh, my wife, uh, I don't know if you can see this here, uh, provided the illustration of Walt Whitman mm -hmm. in this. In fact, in here she's contributed a dozen illustrations. This is called Wound Dresser, which was his nickname, Walt Whitman. Because he was of his time in the Civil War. Oh, absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whitman brings them candy, books, and solace as their injuries from the uncivil war fester and resist healing. He loves their youth and listens to their battlefield accounts as intently as any minister or parent would. The great army of the sick relentlessly fills hospitals with its maimed and distressed as the bard of de democracy holds vigils for the countless dying. Later, at his makeshift desk in the embalming station, he sets to paper the tears that have accumulated in his quill. Tears in his quill. Te tears in his quill. Uh, let's see. Probably, uh, uh, excuse me for... I'm trying to find something here that that is appropriate for your audience. <laughs> Let me go uh, Let's see. Wait. I should have marked off a few more. I didn't realize you were going to be so generous with yeah. your time. This is called, and this is a very short one, Christopher Hitchens meets God. I remember he wrote that memoir about his dying, right? Yes, yeah, yeah, yes, yeah. Catch-22, Yeah, I think. Oh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, very acerbic. Uh, Hitch-22. Very acerbic critic. Very, yeah. yeah, yeah, I really love the guy. He's one of the most brilliant intellects uh, 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 in the last 50 years, really wonderful. So this is uh, called Christopher Hitchens Meets God, and uh, I, I should probably make clear to, to, to your audience who may not know him that he was an utterly dedicated, committed atheist and the, that he had debated many uh, uh, prominent church people almost always coming out victorious in any debate with uh, religious people. And this is uh, a little spin on that. Christopher Hitchens meets God. Hitchens. Well, I can see that I was wrong. God. No, the evidence was weak. My bad. <laughs> and uh, as you said, he passed, uh, away. Uh, passed away a, cup, a couple of years ago. Very, very sad. Yeah. But he, uh, he, he never uh, 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 conceded to, to uh, uh, religion. He stayed committed to what he was, despite, uh, I think, uh, many, many attempts by, by church people to, to see if he might, in the end, uh, change his mind. Uh, he did, and that's... Th uh, uh, th this, this one was actually li uh, uh, lifted from the news of some 50 years ago. It's called, Famous Intellectuals Debate and a threat of physical violence ensues. Gore Vidal, shut up a minute. William F. Buckley, no I won't. Gore Vidal, you're a pro-war crypto-Nazi. Buckley, stop calling me a crypto-Nazi or I'll knock you in the goddamn face. And there's a little note at the bottom saying, excerpted from the televised 1968 Democratic Convention debating debate uh, featuring William F. Buckley and Gore Vidal. Yeah, it was on Dick Cavett, I believe. Yeah, yeah as a matter uh, of fact. I've, I've uh, seen that uh, many times. That's, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that. Uh, he also had a great, he was fighting, uh, uh, Gore, Duval, uh, Gore Vidal uh, also argued with um, Norman Mailer, I believe. Oh, argued. God, that, that was a feud that yeah, was yeah. ongoing, I think, uh, in many respects. 
Uh, I'm not sure if it was a pseudo feud because it definitely benefited both of those. Do I have time for another one? Or? Yeah, you got about four minutes. Okay, yeah. this is called Silent Migraines. Silent Migraines, of which I suffer. Uh, silent Migraines. After examining my eyes, the ophthalmologist said, I have bad news and good news. The bad news is you are suffering from what we call silent migraines. Mm -hmm. The good news is that you don't experience the painful headaches that accompany regular migraines. But you will have occasions when you will not fully see what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And I might have one uh, if, uh, if I can find it very, very quickly. No, no we got time. And so uh, there was one I did want to. Um, oh, this, uh, th uh, this is uh, a kind of an homage uh, to Sylvia Plath. Okay. Okay. It's called Did Ted Abuse Sylvia? Rumor is it did, or he did, I should say. Rumor fact. <laughs> Rumor fact, yes. Sylvia, well, I like it just the way it is. Ted, but why ever would you use an ellipsis there? Sylvia, because nothing else would work as well. Ted, those dots are such a magician's ruse. Sylvia, it's my poem after all. Ted, yes it is, love. Yes, it is. Sylvia, I must get my soul back from you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, uh, he had two deaths. Uh, he, another one of his, uh, his mistress and then his later wife right. killed herself too. And right. Plath's son killed himself. It was a pretty yeah, tragic Yeah, you know, I mean, he was a wonderful writer, but I just don't think and I'd want... And that's a good question, just briefly. Um, can you separate the man from, uh, from his art? Ah, that's one particularly... of the great questions in literature. Yeah. Um, can you separate? Um, I think it's pretty hard to separate because I think anything that comes from a person is part of that person. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's the way I look at it. I think, uh, is, there, is there such a thing as pure isolated creativity? Uh, not if it comes from, I guess, someone's mind. Uh, but l as I say, there's so much debate uh, about that. I, I suspect, as in your poetry and in my stories, there's there there's invariably a little piece of us in there, right, uh, right. Yeah. You have a website, Mike? Yes, yes. As a matter of fact, it's probably not as updated as I would like it to be, but it's www.michaelckeith.com. Come and say hello. Okay, and you just retired from BC, and and that seemed to go well for you. So far, so good. Thank I'm enjoying you. it. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Doug.